Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Particular welcome if you are watching this live. Uh, apologies again for last week. Uh, I just I was just a little bit unwell and decided that me sneezing at you for an hour or two was uh, was probably not what you wanted. But uh, we are back this week. I'm feeling a lot better. Thank you so much for everyone who uh, messaged me about that. Uh, we are back this week with a new topic. Um, we will come back, I think, next week to what we were going to do last week. Uh, I had a fantastic guest lined up on a great topic all about art and uh, symbolism within the Song of Ice and Fire. We'll do that next week. But this week, uh, we've got back somebody who uh, was on quite a lot a while ago, and then has, uh, I've not had him on for a while, and I've been missing his inputs. Uh, but why don't we uh, uh, welcome him back. Joe Magician, Matt, how are you? Hey, Robert. How's it going? How's it going, chat? Give you the double guns <laughs> right there. Uh, yeah, uh, after uh, after season eight, um, you know, some personal stuff came up, and it was kind of a uh, shooting gallery out there. So I kind of laid low for a little bit, but I'm getting back in the swing of things. I've got uh, one video in production now, did one last week or two weeks ago, and list of stuff to do. So getting back into it, got the fire lit again. <laughs> Excellent news. Uh, and for those who do not know, uh, Matt is one of the most erudite and original thinking members of our community, and he has got a channel that he was far oh, too yeah. modest to mention. Uh, do you want to tell us where people yeah. can find you? Uh, yep. Uh, YouTube.com slash Joe Magician. You can also find me um, on the Maester Monthly podcast, um, which myself and the other Song of Ice and Fire mods put on just talking about fun stuff we see on Reddit. And... Also, oh, there's a podcast feed too. Um, <laughs> the, the, I, because I'm clever, I call it the wit and wisdom of Joe Magician. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, whole thing. If you just want to listen to my long things without seeing the slideshow on top of it. Well, excellent. I, I do remember what my old intro always was that you're you're the man who you'd require a five minute intro time because you're <laughs> everywhere. Titles and um, titles. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, do. Check him out. Um, I highly recommend it. A um, couple of super chats coming in quickly. Lisa Love, thank you so much. Very generous. Saying, for my favorite topic with two of my favorites, thank you. And Stephen Stark saying, uh, best looking live stream ever. Well, wow. Stephen, you're a flatterer. It would only be improved by your presence. Make um, me blush. What we're talking about today is the Tower of Joy, which is uh, a subject that I love. I know lots of other people love as well. It's uh, fascinating because we know that it's central to what happened in A Song of Ice and Fire, and yet we have so little information. So we need to kind of uh, sort of pick away a little details. We get around all of the stories to try and come up with a picture of what we've got. I chose this because I did a video a few days ago which is the last in looking at the Tower of Joy itself. My next video in that series is going to be all about why Ned went to Starfall afterwards. Uh, but this one was looking at some of the questions that bugged me most, like did they really tear down the tower? Um, and why why didn't he return the bodies of his bannerman? Things like that. So all of these questions are open today. This is a big Q&A session, as always framing this around uh, some questions I got from my patrons. Thank you, patrons. It was thank you, patron day yesterday. Uh, so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, we've got some great questions. Why don't we start with a um, uh, uh, question from Pia Herbner saying, hello, Robert and Joe. Why couldn't Liana send a confidential message to the Starks to clarify the rumors and to avoid those stupid massacres? Uh, she could have invited them or a reliable friend to Dawn. So, what, what do you recommend? Why didn't she just stop it all from happening? Well, there's a there's a few different um, layers going on here. I think the the basic level one is that letters in Westeros go very, very, very slowly. It takes weeks and months for messages even to travel by Raven. Uh, people riding up the King's Road will take forever. So by the time she sent the letter, whoever she was sending it to probably wasn't there anymore. Then they would have to relay it forward. So probably wouldn't have changed that much. But I think the, the second level is the um, the controversial statement from the show that Robert's Rebellion was built on a lie. The The truth of it is that the Rebellion was no longer about Rhaegar and Lyanna. They were the light, they were the match that lit the keg, but the keg itself was Ares's abuses towards his, uh, towards his lords and people. So 
even at the point that she says, by the way, I'm not kidnapped, that doesn't really matter. Those lords did not go to war for Lyanna Stark or Rhaegar Targaryen. They went for Ares and the dead uh, Rhaegar Stark and the um, other lords that Ares killed. Yeah, I think that's a couple of really valid points. So um, uh, I, I think the only thing I would add to this is this idea of timing that uh, I did a whole video on this uh, about why why didn't they say something? Um, <laughs> basically, if you look at the time it took them to get from near Harrenhal, which is where the meeting slash abduction slash whatever you call it took place, down to the Tower of Joy, by the time they'd done that, the whole continent had moved from a position of simmering tensions to all-out war, mm -hmm. and it could not have actually, by that point, it couldn't have actually been stopped. Um, so it, it was it was too late. And in terms of sending something to the Starks to say, hey, by the way, this is all a big mistake. I actually kind of like this guy. Who are the Starks at this point? <laughs> it's, there, there are two of them. It. There's Benjen, and Benjen already knew this. Yeah. But Benjen was a child, and, and I think this is the tragedy of Benjen Stark is the fact that he he did know that they were uh, in love, they got together and all the rest of it, but he didn't say because he'd been asked not to, and then it was too late for him, and the whole continent was at war, and he felt this huge crushing weight on his shoulders. Why didn't I say something? So I think that's the first bit, and hence him going to the, to the wall, becoming a member of the Night's Watch. And then secondly, Ned, Ned was all off on his own little trip uh, through the mountains um, uh, in the Vale. He got shipwrecked. He had to trek across land all the way across the north. We got to, uh, to Winterfell. By the time he got there, Benjamin was there and he learned it anyway. So actually, there's, there's nothing. It wouldn't have there's changed a thing. Yeah. Exactly. Even, there's, oh, go on. I'm sorry. I would I would add on to add, uh, add on to this that it appears that probably Rickard Stark also knew that it was not an abduction because he showed up in King's Landing with no soldiers, no army. He didn't do what Rob Stark did when he knew it was a the letter from King's Landing was a was war. Rickard showed up ex, ex, um, expecting that he could talk his way out of it, smooth tensions over. So he probably knew that it wasn't actually a big problem, and Ares just did Ares things. Yeah, I think that's a valid point. I, 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 I'd not really thought about what Rickard uh, was about and what he thought, but yeah, he certainly didn't turn up in a very confrontational manner, unlike uh, Brandon, his son, of course. Or many other people. Many other people go to King's Landing with an army on much lesser things. Rickard's supposedly a very smart guy, a politician. He's, you know, he has a lot of connections throughout the other lords, and he's like, all right, well, Brandon sucks, but I can talk my way out of this. Not many other yeah. people would do that. Not many other Starks would do that. Cregan's, like Cregan and Rob, they show up with armies, even at the slightest insult. Yeah, exactly. So I think that the, uh, the Pierre, I think that the, the answer to your question is by the time that they realized that there was something they should say, uh, the, the Baratheons had raised their armies, the, the North has raised its army, the, uh, the veil has raised its, uh, its army, the crown has raised an army, and everybody's fighting everybody else, and it was just too late. Um, we had a, so Anna Munzinger, uh, thank you so much for the super chat, saying my first live stream, woo, welcome. Uh, welcome to you, and welcome to anyone else. Did I do the woo right? I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, so if this is your first live stream, uh, welcome, do get in involved in the chat. Um, what we try to do is is pick up as many questions as we can from the chat as they're going through. I saw somebody was complimenting your haircut, by the way, uh, as well, a <laughs> moment you. ago. Uh, so uh, I, I, do, I do, I don't see everything that goes through in the chat, but I do keep an eye out for really important messages like that one. So uh, there we go. For compliments at my appearance. Thanks, Rob. Ex <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. And I would agree, it is a fine looking haircut. Uh, Vanessa Bogart says, was Liana not aware that Ned was outside? I seem to remember that she was calling his name. Uh, seems that she could have ordered the Kingsguard to stand down. 
Now, what do you reckon on this one? What I'll give as context for this is uh, when uh, we say remembering that she was calling his name, this was in the fever dream that Ned had. So we shouldn't take it quite literally. But yes, within that fever dream, he did, as the battle was raging, hear her crying out. So what do you reckon? Could Lyanna have stopped the battle outside? Uh, probably not. It's The Kingsguard were there for reasons that are still kind of muddy. Um, either they were there because Rhaegar ordered them or because Ares ordered them. One of the two. And both of those guys were dead and they were still there fighting. So whatever their previous command was, they were taking it seriously. And like they also weren't letting Lyanna leave. Like She was... I think there was much almost her jailers as much as they were her protectors. She wasn't allowed to go anywhere. It was just basically her in the tower with uh, whatever handmaiden or um, midwife was there with her. So if they're not listening already, they're not going to listen to Liana at that point. Especially, I don't even know if they recognize her as the as a member of the royal family. It sort of depends. The show makes it explicit that yes, Rhaegar and Liana did marry. It's kind of more murky in the in the books, I would say. Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, my my take on this, again, I did one of the videos of my series is, you know, why did they fight? And the the answer that I came to was that um, these guys, we think about them as being these great heroes, but the Kingsguard were that, particularly that lot, were the most jobsworthy jobsworths ever. Mm -hmm. They just took their last, whatever they were told to do, they did it and they did not think about any of the repercussions or the moral implications or anything. We get, we hear incidents of um, uh, of effectively a violent rape happening and the King's Guard standing there not doing anything about it. Mm. We get murders, horrible murders happening and the King's Guard standing by and not doing anything it they were going to do what they were told to do regardless and it, it makes sense that Rhaegar's last words because he thought he was going to come back yeah. he thought he was going to win the battle he was going to come back his back last no words problem. his last oh, exactly his last order would have been something like don't let anyone in they don't care who they are particularly the Starks because they're the other side that would be a thing that they would live or die by and it, in the fever dream I think the other thing I would add on this one is that we shouldn't take the literal truth of what was happening there, but the feel of it clearly conveys something that is part of Ned's recollections. And at least half of that fever dream is the Kingsguard giving their reasons for standing their ground. <laughs> yeah. And and it's them saying, we don't bend the knee to anyone. We stand up, we, we obey our orders and all the rest of it. They say it so many different times to all these different challenges that Ned comes up with. Whether or not we think that exact conversation happened, clearly Ned's subconscious has taken on board the fact that the Kingsguard were not going to back down. And to add on to that, you can make arguments that Arthur Dane and Oswald went were there for Rhaegar because Arthur Dane was basically his best friend. Him and Oswald went were also close. There's the theory that Rhaegar organized the tourney at Harrenhal through House Went in order to try and depose Ares. But the White Bull is not really ever noted as being Rhaegar's pal. So he's there, and not for personal reasons. That should really tell you. And he's he's one of the guys that stood aside while Ares killed and raped and did horrible things. So, yeah, he he's not a guy that's going to be there for personal reasons. It's all about duty for them at that point. And they're taking it yeah. seriously against, I would say, very reasonable terms from Ned, which are, you don't have to die today. Yeah, pretty much. And 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 I so I think that we we just have to take this view that they were going to do what they were going to do and whatever was happening with Liana, they were not letting Ned in. Um, mm. So that that seems to be it. She may well have called out to Ned, but they weren't going to obey her orders when they'd already got orders from Rhaegar. Nobody was moving them except Rhaegar or Ares, and they were deadsies. <laughs> well, quite. <laughs> so, um, Maura Lee, thank you so much. I, before we went live, Maura did a couple of very generous super chats. Thank you so much. Um, saying just a love of uh, just a show of love and appreciation for all the excellent content. Looking forward to the relaunching of the well-told tale later this month. 
I will tell you more about that later, guys, uh, and listen to more of the Mountains of Madness. Can't wait for more of the Traveler's Guide through Essos. Yes, there will be one tomorrow. Um, we are getting close to Volantis, which I am very excited by. It's an amazing city. Um, and also, in honor of Joe Magician as a guest today, I love your channel as well, Joe, as well as your fabulous insights regarding both the Song of Ice and Fire books and the show. This is why I have him on, I uh, have fabulous insights. Um, but Maura asked a question, which was, I would like to know what happened to all the maidservants, maester, etc., that would have uh, waited on Liana during her lying in and helping to prepare for John's birth. Uh, were they killed or sacrificed? Uh, were they bribed? Were their bodies buried under the cans? Now, this was something you, you sort of mentioned briefly about a midwife. This, I think, is one of the things that hasn't been tackled enough mm -hmm. in in people's understanding of what happened at the Tower of Joy is it was not just Lyanna on her own in a right. tower and three kings guard outside. There will have been other people. Now, to my mind, as far as this, this sort of conversation goes, it doesn't matter exactly to me who those people were. Was there a companion for Lyanna? Was there a maester? Were there any squires for the knights? Uh, what about a midwife? There there probably will have been more people there. The question is, what happened to them? Now, in my last video, I I put a kind of a grisly solution out there that they didn't survive. Oh. Maybe maybe they, we're told there are eight cans. We weren't told there were eight bodies. Maybe there's more than eight bodies buried there. Uh, what, what do you think happened? You clearly suspect that there was at least a midwife. What, what uh, happened to these people? Well, I think the obvious answer of there probably was the midwife, and it was probably Wyla. the The story about uh, John and um, who is it? It's um, Ned Dane being milk brothers is probably true. That's she was probably there from John's birth, and then took him all the way to uh, Winterfell with Ned. I would say it's fairly certain that she was there, but you know. When you look at the geography of Dorne, and especially where the Tower of Joy is, it's in a really isolated place in the mountains above the Prince's Pass. There's no obvious towns or castles nearby, especially those that, um, that because they needed supplies. You need food, you need water, you're in Dorne, there's no food, there's like no apple trees nearby, there's no lemon trees nearby, you can't even live on lemons anyway. So <laughs> there's clearly some kind of supply line going to Liana and the Tower of Joy this whole time, and to Rhaegar. Uh, probably, provided, probably provided by the Danes, I would guess, and some of their allies in Western Dorne, maybe the Martells, although the Martells don't really seem to be uh, too read in on what was happening with Rhaegar. I mean, like, they're not upset with him about Elia, but I would, I would be surprised if they were involved with uh, actively supplying them. So there's probably some sort of squire, there's somebody carrying messages, there's somebody going down and bringing food, there's probably a midwife for Leon. I would say probably not a maester. Um, if they had a maester, they probably would have sent more letters, I would say. And I and a lot of people in Westeros have a distrust of the maesters, that they think that they serve the realm more than the individual lords a lot more than people want them to. So if somebody knew that Rhaegar and Lyanna were there, maybe they would have dropped a dime on them. I don't know. I tend to think they all survived um, and they went back to Starfall with Ned because I think this is, this is just tinfoil. <laughs> I've always been confused by the, by the returning of Dawn to House Dane and then letting him inside, giving him supplies and sending him on his way. And then, you know, naming one of their sons after him, the heir to their house. Well, if he saved all the servants, brought back Don, they probably, and they told him the story of what happened. That's probably how he got inside and probably how he bought, you know, a trip back to the North with instructions to basically never come back. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, I, I have a habit of spoiling my next videos here. Uh, I haven't written my next video in this series, but this is, I think, where I'm going to go with this is that uh, I... If you think about this from House Dane's perspective, I agree with you completely. Arthur Dane was clearly in on this. Mm -hmm. Ashara Dane makes sense that she was in on this, not just because she's one of these cool characters whose names we kind of bandy around, but she was uh, she was handmade to uh, Elia Martell, so she was 
close in there. It makes sense that she started out all of this at Harren Hall. Um, then she was at Dragonstone. Then she ended up at Starfall. She was where the action went. She was involved in some way. Um, it makes sense, as you say, that if anywhere is sort of provisioning this place, then it's going to be House Dane. Uh, what the situation was there at that time was that Robert Baratheon would have gone absolutely ape on mm -hmm. a, whoever it was who had been sheltering Rhaegar Targaryen. And if Ned Stark was the person who not only returned their family sword, but protected them and their entire family from the wrath of Robert Baratheon, mm -hmm. that is indeed worthy of them uh, sort of uh, honouring him with the name of their son because they would not have carried on as a family otherwise. No, they would have been but, done. That's It's a, yeah. one of the more honourable things Ned ever did, never telling... I mean, he was protecting John, but he also saved their entire family going back 10,000 years. He, he ensured they continued to exist, which is a service not many houses have. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So I think th this is the this is the honorable and, and uh, I, I know that there's you know some idea that maybe this was. Uh, in fact, we'll get onto Ned and Ashara later, so we'll 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 yeah. pick up on that. But uh, I, I think for me, this is the much more likely reason for that. Um, uh, but so, do you think that there were other people? is the question. So what, what I was speculating was that maybe there were other people who had to be silenced, given the, given the, you know, the, the sort of the question, are you a, you know, will you keep quiet or not? And if not, what would Ned and Howland have to do? They would have to kill them. So do you think that's possible? I think it's unlikely that Ned would do that. He has such a um, reverence for his subjects and the servants of his household that he would find any reason not to kill these people. Howland maybe would have done it. Um, it we don't really know much about him. I mean, in, at least in the show, they depicted him as killing Arthur Dane by stabbing him in the back. So I would think that Ned would find reasons to save all the household people, the midwife, Wyla, whoever else was there, unless he absolutely had to. And, you know, I think I think it's a fair bargain. I'll bring you back to your home if you tell them what happened. That seems like a fairly reasonable trade. Nobody wants yeah. to die there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's I think that's fair. As I say, I, I think that the the fact is that there were no no survivors emerged from the Tower of Joy who were not 100 percent loyal. That I mm -hmm. think is one thing that we can we can say. Um, and I think I would agree that. Uh, Howland is more likely to be an executioner than Ned in this, um, although Ned's honour is more about love for his family as mm -hmm. as his driver here. Um, Phil H in the chat saying there was likely no maester assigned to the tower. Probably. True, uh, it was just a tower, uh, but uh, there will have been a maester uh, assigned to Starfall, which is the point that we're trying to make, is that if a maester was involved, as seems entirely possible then this will be uh one shipped in from starfall so basically starfall other people yeah. uh and, and house Dane, they're they're the ones who've been orchestrating all of this um okay uh let's get on to some more tinfoil this was from frown <laughs> frown pouch um saying my tinfoil would love your thoughts some kind of magic happened at the tower of joy that killed the king's guard and destroyed the tower my assumption would be Howland's magic. The bodies either were disfigured by the magic in such a way, a supernatural way, that they couldn't be brought home without revealing the magic, uh, i.e. melted, wow, good magic, um, wow. or B, uh, the other Northmen witnessed the magic and freaked out and had to be killed by Hound and Ned, and this was Ned's broken promise, murdering his own sworn men. Uh, so what do, you, what do you reckon to that, that there was some magic going on at the Tower of Joy? I love this idea that uh, Howland Reed is basically like an earthbender from Avatar, the last airbender. Like he's just like moving stuff around, killing everybody. People are exploding with magic. Um, I would say that is not something we see in A Song of Ice and Fire. That's definitely a thing you see in some of George's under other stories where he leans much more into high fantasy. Even in uh, the story Night Flyers, a head explodes from psychic power. Like 
yeah, that would be if that kind of thing could happen. It doesn't really seem like that's going on here. Um, I that sounds really interesting. I I think actually, I mean, I don't I don't believe the tinfoil, but it'd be super interesting to see a a high fantasy version of a song of ice and fire, where like all these theories about like these characters pushing their <laughs> magic to like crazy levels leveling stuff with words like pulling gandalf style magic that'd be a really interesting take on it but probably not what's not what's happening here george tends to um tease that these things are possible and then not deliver in a song of ice and fire in particular well I, i'm gonna push back on that one actually okay. i think so my take is that george R. R. martin starts off um with a low fantasy feel but book one is kind of bracketed by high fantasy. You get the others at the very beginning, you get the dragons appearing at the very end. So what he's trying to say is this is secretly high magic, but actually this is low fantasy in the middle. Mm -hmm. As we move through the books, the, the, the kind of the magic starts coming up a notch all the time. Somebody gets brought back from the dead Oh, it seems that people can uh, do walking into animals. Hang on a moment, what's going on here? People, we get someone who can uh, use tree magic to see the past and the future. And, and it's just like each step, it goes on and gets bigger and bigger. So it's starting at this low fantasy point, and it's going to end a high fantasy point. What we've got with Howland Reed is a character who we're told is magical. Now, we don't know huge amounts about him as a person, but Mira, who is one of the few people who obviously knows him, says, get, lists these things that he can do, like turning um, uh, sort of one substance into another substance, making castles appear and disappear. These sound like actual proper magical things that he can mm -hmm. do. Um, it would fit for me completely into how George R. R. Martin is structuring A Song of Ice and Fire, for there to have been a high magic moment at the beginning of all of this that we didn't know about. And it only gets revealed at the end because he's starting, he's pretending this is low fantasy, but really this is high fantasy. What do you reckon to that? Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> the type of high fantasy he does is not usually the kind of thing um, this tinfoil is talking about though, where it's like, people being like erupting with magic and their bodies being twisted and weird. Like the dragons do that, but like you already know they're there. They burn stuff with their fire breath. Um, the, the kind of, this is more like, I would say like a very video game style, a high fantasy they're talking about where like they're making their bodies like explode and like twist them into weird magic things. And it's like, oh, okay, I guess so. But like the closest we've ever gotten to that is the shadow baby and I don't think Helen Reed's popping out one of those. And then the uh, the Carthine fire mage that climbs up a ladder and disappears. It's like the I don't know. He'd have to have like a bottle of wildfire <laughs> or something to make this happen. So you're you're right that it does it does tend towards the fantasy that he loves. But I don't think it's this style. I think that um, what he's what he's doing is much more in line with uh, thinking about like necromancy and more psychic sort of stuff, which is what they tend to be. Yeah, and I mean, a couple of people in the chat have been saying uh, so. Uh, Mary Laura Newman saying if Ned had witnessed magic so early on, I think he'd have been less likely to dismiss rambling. Probably, about the yeah, that's a good point. Wall. Uh, Wall deserter. A crisp says, I think the quote from Catelyn too uh, that Ned never had time for such things regarding omens, etc is telling about how the tower shaped his opinion on magic, et cetera. So I think that there's, um, I, Ned seems quite down to earth, quite grounded. He doesn't seem to think that, doesn't seem to operate in this world of, yes, there's lots of magic out there. Uh, the kind of counter to that, I guess, is the mm -hmm. fact that he is trying desperately to just forget what happened at the Tower of Joy. Um, and so that's that's a thing which is like he gets he gets these terrible dreams about it, but he clearly is suffering from some kind of PTSD, wants not to be mm -hmm. thinking about it at all. So I, I don't think we can look back at Ned's part, Ned's uh, from that perspective, future conduct to say whether or not magic happened there. 
I think in terms of the kind of magic, yes, this would be different, but we're told that mm -hmm. Howland had all the magic of the Kranagmen. Now, we've never met any other Kranagmen, so we don't know what all the magic of the Kranagmen actually means, yeah. but I think the implication is that this is going to be quite closely aligned with the magic of the children of the forest, not in terms of kind of green sight and stuff like that, but the other things that they can do. And we do hear of some things that they allegedly can do, like the hammer of the waters and stuff like Whatever that. Whatever that is. Exactly. Um, but it does seem pretty destructive. So I think I would personally be disappointed if Howland Reed, having been set up as a magic user, at no point uses any magic. Um, I would like that to either have happened in the past or happen in the future, but maybe it's just because I'm a Howland fanboy. I don't know. <laughs> it's... I mean, it's not wrong to want these things. I mean, it would be really cool. <laughs> like uh, it... that, that style of high fantasy magic, like the casting of spells and more of the stuff you see in like um, in like modern video games are is awesome. There's a reason people like it. I just I'm gonna pump the brakes on that one personally. Boring. Okay, well, uh, let's go with, so Three-Eyed Monkey, thank you so much for the Super Chat, saying lots of old stone towers in Europe are built from unmortared stone that you could literally take down stone by stone. Mm. Ned said stones, not bricks, and he said they were bloody probably from his hands. Uh, so this is um, talking about a quote. I did, I actually got a, I got this section of the book up because I thought, you know, it would be useful at some point to do this. Um, we've got um, uh, the uh, quote was um, Ned had pulled the tower down afterward. Um, this is after the battle and used its bloody stones to build eight cairns upon the ridge. So that's the that's the sort of, that's the extent of what we have about mm -hmm. the pulling the tower down. Uh, they were stones. Uh, Three-Eyed Monkey, yes, th there are stone towers built from unmortared stone. There are many stone walls and things like that as well. Um, uh, my take is that these tend not to be um, sort of the kind of castles that or secure places that you would put your lover, your pregnant lover, and say, right, this is where my child is going to be born. Um, I think the implication is that this was a reasonably robust structure, um, uh, which probably means mortared stone. We don't know, but that's kind of the implication I, I have. Um, uh, and in terms of the bloody stones, I think there are two options here. Either, uh, as you say, this was something that Ned did to make them bloody, not the battle, but something else, or this was just hyperbole and poetic language and all the rest of it, um, <laughs> which is entirely possible. And, and if, if I had to guess, it would be the latter. But what do you, have you got any thoughts on that one, Matt, about the, the stone tower? The ability to pull it down. Um, I thought your yeah. horse argument was a fairly good one. Um, yeah, they do have a lot of horses. They have a lot of <laughs> horsepower. Hey! <laughs> no? Thank you. Not a good one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but when you look at the Tower of Joy... It's it's a watchtower, not a place meant to really uh, defend from sieges. Like not the sort of thing that would be built to withstand a lot of um, a lot of battle, like things running into it. It's sort of just there to, you know, watch. Obviously, shoot things with bows and arrows, run away when people get too close. So yeah, I think it's reasonable that you could pull it down. Um, you see these kind of structures all over the place. Um, especially in your neck of the woods, there's crumbling old structures everywhere and you can knock them over pretty easily if you want to. Not just in our parliament. Um, <laughs> well, you've political been, uh, humor. We move, move on quickly. Uh, um, let's, uh, I, I was just, for those who are wondering what, when Matt was talking about the, uh, the horses, this is the, what I was pointing out was we often think about this as being just, can two men, Ned and Howland, pull down a tower which is stone built, uh, which is presumably, if it's a tower, at least three stories high. Um, and my uh, my view is that it wasn't just them. It was, at the very least, there were, um, I can't remember how many I said, 10, 11 horses mm -hmm. 
there were seven for Ned and his companions, three for the King's Guard. Leanna will definitely have had a horse as well. Um, the King's Guard may well have had more than one horse each. Um, if there was anyone else there, they would have had a horse and they may well have been able to help. So it wasn't just two mm -hmm. people. It was uh, you know, at least a whole load of very strong, highly trained horses and possibly a few extra people as well. So I think, I think the answer is it's possible. Hard work. And it's the thing that they would have made a deliberate decision to do, mm -hmm. not just a, hey, shall we do this? Yeah, all right, let's do it. It was a, they, they would have deliberately said, you know, because it's not the first thing that comes into your mind, is it? Why don't we tear down this stone tower in front of us? So it, it was a deliberate decision to do it. Um, it was possible, in my view. Um, and I think, but I think it probably was a robust, to come back to the original question, I think it probably was a robust structure, um, uh, but they uh, they had more help than we sometimes think. Um, a couple of people in the chat talking about PTSD, which I sort of sometimes have said Ned has the equivalent of PTSD. Um, uh, I probably shouldn't throw it around like that without too much context. Um, but uh, yeah, so my, my take is that this was a traumatic experience for Ned, that uh, everything we see of him after that in the books is he remembers it, but he it's not a happy memory for him. And so he tries not to, and he doesn't want other people thinking about this either. So that's that's what that's what I'm trying to say there. I was using PTSD as a shorthand for that. It may well not be clinically what was going on there. Um, there we had another chat three ad monkey again thank you so much saying perhaps Rhaegar and Lyanna were on their way from Summer Hall to Starfall when Lyanna could travel no further um well I mean I like this uh in the sense that I have a sneaky feeling that I can't prove that I have a sneaky feeling that they went via Summer Hall um to the Tower of Joy because I subscribed to the idea that um, uh, the Woods Witch went there who became the ghost of High Heart, uh, and it was her that Rhaegar met when he kept on going back to Summer Hall, and I think that he, he may well have taken Lyanna there afterwards. So I like that idea that they went to Summer Hall and then were heading towards Starfall. Um, my take, though, is that they were trying to hide away somewhere, so I think this was a deliberate choice of a place uh, where the Tower of Joy is. Uh, I don't think it was just that, oh, I can't go any further, I've got to have a baby. Um, but maybe. What, what, do you, what do you think on that one, Matt? I think that's a perfectly reasonable uh, guess. I mean, yeah, if she was pregnant and for whatever reason they needed to stop, maybe Arthur, who knows the area, suggested... All right, I guess we're I guess we're gonna go up here and just camp out or something like that. Sure, makes sense to me. Um, I tend to. Hmm. Why didn't they? I, why wouldn't they just go to Starfall? Is a good question though. Or yeah, just keep going on the way they were going. Um, the whole thing. I think what people have, I think, a misunderstanding about Rhaegar and Lyanna is that there's a very good chance that Rhaegar and Lyanna did not think they were hiding that they didn't think they were running from anything. They, the war didn't break out until well after they were gone. Information does not travel fast. There's a, it's a pretty good shot that they were surprised to hear that in their wake, Brandon Stark had charged into King's Landing areas, had killed a couple of lords, and now the entire realm was at war. So it may have just been like a nice spot to stay for a few days, and then they got trapped there or something like that. Or maybe that's where they were. Then they heard about the war and then decided it was unsafe to go to Starfall lest they risk House of Dane or something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think all of those are entirely possible. I think my uh, the other thing I would add into this, which is something that we don't talk about enough, I think, in terms of Robert's Rebellion, is the position of Dawn, not the sword, the place, um, and the Martells. Now, this will have been, yes, the Martells where they were super liberal and all the rest of it, and, and they, were, I'm sure, wouldn't have had a problem whatsoever with um, uh, Rhaegar and Lyanna. Um, if you're not convinced on that, I understand completely. I did do a video on it, which I hope explains it better, but they they were absolutely okay with polyamorous relationships and all the rest of it. Um, but 
I think that if Rhaegar was wanting this new child to be legitimate, that would necessarily create some issues that need to be he would need to discuss mm -hmm. with the Martells, and they would need to come to a formal understanding. So my take is that what they would have done is they would have stopped off somewhere. The the Martells would have known they were there. Probably, yeah. This, this is the, 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 the fact of it, as far as I can tell. So the Prince's Pass, for those who don't know, this was the main thoroughfare between most of the Seven Kingdoms and Dawn. This was where armies could march up and down. Um, they will have known if one of their watchtowers on that, at a time of war, they will have been keeping an eye on their borders. They will have known if one of their watchtowers suddenly got inhabited by three kings, Guard and Rhaegar Targaryen. Uh, that will not have been a surprise to them. So I think that almost certainly what would have happened is that that is the point at which they had to stop and then start the negotiations on what's going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's my take. And that's why I personally think that a maester is probably quite likely uh, to have been there because that's, that's how they would have done the uh, the communication. But uh, yeah, I don't think it was just a random place. They chose Dawn because Dawn were one of the only friendly places in the Seven Kingdoms at the time. And I think that they needed to be communicating with the Martells. And also to point out that Rhaegar has silver hair and purple eyes and Lyanna looks very much like a northerner. They would have stuck out walking down the Prince's Pass. I mean, the the big part of A Feast for Crows, the, uh, the Dornish plotline is how everybody's spying on everybody and how they notice people that don't belong in those kind of places. The crown prince and his girlfriend would definitely have been noticed, and they didn't even seem to be trying to hide that much. They're walking down the main road. <laughs> They're not sneaking through the mountains. They're not on a secret boat landing on a beach and running up to Starfall. They're walking down the main thoroughfare of Dorne in a time when they were part of the Seven Kingdoms proper. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and this is not just, you know, uh, he could have put a hood on or something like that. They're this was Kingsguard as well, dressed in mm -hmm. white and all the rest of it. You you could not hide. They, they, they even have a house, House Fowler, whose entire job it is to be guarding this yeah. uh, thing. They they would have known that they were there. So um, this was one of the other things that I had not realised until I started studying the Tower of Joy in this amount of detail. This is how Ned knew where to go mm -hmm. because it wasn't a secret. Um, it was, yes, it was a secret from Robert Baratheon, but when you start adding up how many people have to have known where this was, and you get, okay, so you get the, the, the King's Guard who were there, Rhaegar knew where it was. Uh, you, we, we've already established that um, the Food, uh, water. the Danes, House Danes, exactly, must have, uh, must have known what, it, uh, what was going on. So you'd have to have people shuttling stuff to and fro. Um, someone would have need to have been there possibly a maester, possibly a midwife in order to help deliver the baby. There's no way Rhaegar would have just said, help, you have the baby on your own. There would have been somebody there. Um, if the maesters knew uh, and if he was trying to communicate with the Martells, uh, as we already talked about House Fowler knew, the Martells knew, this was a secret, but it was not a really close-knit thing with only the four or five people knowing where it was. Mm -hmm. This is how Ned knew where to go because this was an open secret in some senses about as where this people was. would talk to him. If, if they would talk to him, they would all know. Exactly. They just would not tell Robert Baratheon because everyone knew what, what Robert Baratheon would do. Um, we've had a super chat from Shay88 with another tinfoil theory. Love these tinfoil theories, guys. Um, uh, thank you so much for the super chat saying... Tinfoil theory, Lyanna was never pregnant. Rhaegar attempts the Azora High on Lyanna, stabs her, botches it, runs away, and orders the King's Guard to hide it. Lyanna accidentally, uh, Lyanna accident opens the wounds. Then when Ned arrives and it bleeds out. So, go on. I'll uh -huh. let you start on this one. Um, no. No. <laughs> No, no, that, that's okay. a different story. <laughs> I think I think I would agree on this one. I think I think it's uh, I like the thinking about Azora High. There clearly are echoes here with with Azora High. Um, that uh, now I, I I'm sure she wasn't the first person to come up with it, but I can remember I first saw it on Gemma's channel, Secrets of the Citadel. This idea 
that yes, there is some echoing of Azora High here, uh, that uh, if you'll uh, allow the slightly uh, uh, pseudonymous language, Rhaegar did indeed stab Lyanna with his sword, um, and that brought forth Lightbringer. Who was John? Uh, yeah. So uh, that that's the the kind of the image that I think we've got going on here, rather than him actually trying to kill her. I don't think that, that was what was going on there. He, all we know about him was that he seemed to want a third child, yeah. and him stabbing Lyanna would not have helped him get a third child. I did I hear that, some re a really interesting tinfoil about that, though. Uh, it's noted that some of the wildfire from under King's Landing was missing, and I've heard theories that people think that he loaded it under the Tower of Joy and was planning to um, Daenerys's pyre that thing. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think so, but it's it was certainly inventive. Yeah, uh, I mean that some of the uh, wildfire is missing is something I've never really figured out i've not put my mind to it it might be that there's a more sensible answer but yeah it's uh, targaryens did light fire um there's no doubting it um and it would certainly make sort of sense for him to have some there i don't know um but um yeah i don't it, I, I i don't personally see the purpose of it because as as much as we understand what he was wanting was to have another child so that he could create the, yeah. the, the dragon that he was after. The only only um, reason it would make sense is the um the only death can pay for life thing. Like if he was trying to hatch dragons, what if there are dragon eggs there? Blah blah blah. I mean, no, but cool and good thinking. Targaryens do like killing people to try and hatch dragons. It is true, but we haven't. Rhaegar never gave any hint that that was what he was trying to do. No, no he seemed to be, he seemed to get obsessed with this idea of the prince that was promised. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. he thought it was him, and he was clearly wrong, and so that he then transferred it across to his son and all the rest of it. So that seems to be what he was obsessed with: prophecy, not dragons. I mean, I'm sure if there was a chance of dragons, he'd love it, but you know, that was <laughs> that wasn't what was driving him. Um, B1 Mary, thank you so much, saying just a thank you for continuing and keeping up the great work, uh, helping me heal from the last few seasons uh, and series and back to the love of the original work and the mysteries within. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I think Matt and I both are very much focusing on the books from now on in. I'm sure I will refer to the TV series um, you know, quite a lot as I carry on going, but uh, for me... The focus of this channel in terms of sort of the Game of Thrones side of it is very much on the books and obviously in time we'll have a spin-off series as well. So that's where my focus is rather than going over the old ground of the TV show. Um, uh, I think I'm, I'm focusing in on what happens in the Winds of Winter next, which is uh, actually uh, really helpful. Thank you, B1 Mary. This is giving me a segue into where I was going to go anyway. Um, uh, uh, roughly halfway through my live streams, what I try and do is just to do a very quick um, uh, sort of trailer for where what, what's happening on my channel coming up over the next few weeks. So um, I am, uh, with my videos, I am finishing off this series on Robert's Rebellion, The Tower of Joy. I've got two or three more to come. As I say, the next one will be why do they go to Starfall? Then I want to do one about um, uh, Aegon, baby Aegon, Fagon, what actually happened there. And then I will want to do, unless I dream up another video, which is entirely possible, then I will want to round it all off with the um, If in Doubt, Blame, Blood, Raven and Howland video, uh, because I just want to tie together all of the ways that Blood, Raven and Howland um, kind of influenced this. Everything we think of what Blood Raven's doing right now, but actually way back then in Robert's Rebellion, Tony at Harren Hall, the rest of it, you can see the hallmarks of his interference even then. So I just want to draw it together with that to end up. That's one lot of videos that I'm finishing. I'm starting up a new series, looking forward to the Winds of Winter, asking a few of the key questions. I did one about who wrote the pink letter and what that might mean. The next video I've got coming out on that one is going to be uh, all about how is John going to be resurrected in the books? I think we probably all agree he will be resurrected in the books, but is it going to be the same? Will it be different? 
that's the my next video um i said i would talk about my second channel the well-told tale um i've got it on pause at the moment because i'm going to do a a big relaunch of that very very soon um, i'm going to launch it not just uh as a youtube channel again i'm going to have it as a dedicated podcast too so that's the aim that's why there's the pause as well as life going on and all the rest of it it's something to look forward to and the third thing i want to say patrons i say this every single time i cannot do this without your support so thank you uh, i really really appreciate it um i genuinely mean i cannot do this without your support so thank you uh, if you are interested in supporting the channel um uh, or you want access to some of the things i do just for my patrons like I do questions on uh, live streams or I do uh, readings from uh, the pre-release chapters of the Winds of Winter, things like that. If you're interested in that, there's a link down to my Patreon in the description. Um, but Matt, as you're here um, and as you do do so many different things, <laughs> what what's coming up for you? Uh, what's coming up for me? I have in progress, I'm going to, I have a, a video talking about the cancellation of the Long Night and the ordering of the entire first season of House of the Dragon, um, talking about what happened there, what to expect, um, maybe a little tinfoil about why when, when one went down and the other one got ordered so quickly. After that, I have a video that um, one of my patrons, uh, Nessie the Questing Beast, is very excited about. It's going to be, I'm, I'm going to title it, I think, uh, Westerosi Horror Story Dragonstone. It's going to be about Andrew Farman's murder of all those people on Dragonstone and who what happened, who was behind it, because almost all the assassinations in A Song of Ice and Fire have the person that did it and the person that pushed them or enabled them to do it. So I'm going to be looking at that. Why was, who enabled this, the dim-witted, um, not very impressive Andrew Farman to somehow kill almost an entire island. So that will be an interesting one. And there's some other videos coming out. I think I'm going to do one about uh, Valyria, a more high fantasy look at things, as we were talking about high fantasy. Um, what powers Valyria? What could the Blood Mages do? All that other kind of stuff. And I think that's what I have on the docket for right now. Although I will say, at many people's urging, I just finished the first book of The Expanse, uh, Leviathan Wakes. I read it in two days, and it was amazing. So I'm going to try and pick up the other ones, and I might do some stuff related to that because I mm -hmm. have not seen a, a book series that hooked me that hard that fast since The Song of Ice and Fire. Wow. I'm, I'm quite excited by that um, because I have, The Expanse is one of the things in terms of a TV show that people keep on encouraging me to watch. Um, and I was intrigued. I was going to ask, actually. You know, I, I have since season eight of Game of Thrones expanded out a bit, I've always covered Westworld. I will be covering Westworld again uh, when season three comes out, but I've started to cover uh, the world of Tolkien and Middle Earth as well. And I was wondering if you were thinking of doing something similar, but uh, if you're going into the expanse, that's excellent. It was it was really, really good. Definitely should pick it up. And also, um, again, like you said, the thank you patron day, a bunch of mine are in the chat as well. Hey guys, how's it going? Thanks for all the support and all that stuff. Also, you can go to joemagician.com slash Patreon if you want free stuff and seeing stuff early and access to my patron Slack. So plug Excellent. over. Free free stuff. How could free you ask for anything more? Uh, <laughs> Morally, thank you so much for your super chat saying thoroughly enjoying this live stream so far. Thank you, Robert and Joe. Very welcome, Maura. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, I like jokes says I actually made a live stream um welcome uh saying <laughs> you're the grand maester of a song of ice and fire law robert i don't know about that but that's very kind of you to say um uh but welcome if, if this is your first time on a live stream then please do say hi in the chat it's uh it's fantastic to see you um this i think is a question for you matt <laughs> following up what you were just saying this is shay 88 saying speaking of the expanse another tinfoil theory the Expanse is a prequel to A Thousand Worlds and possibly A Song of Ice and Fire. Is funny it? That, uh, it is not, but funny okay. story. Uh, it's very closely related. I was actually reading it, and I kept seeing... Uh, I've read most of George's other work, almost all of his short stories. And I was reading, and I was like, I have seen all of this before. Where have I seen this? And I was like, 
that's Night Flyers. That's a song for Leah. That's a, um, a second kind of loneliness. That's uh, A Thousand Worlds. I'm like, what's going on here? And then afterwards, I looked up the author, and it's the, the pen name is James A. Corey, but it's two writers, Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham. And Ty Frank works for George R. R. Martin, and he helped them develop it. So if it's not a prequel to The Thousand Worlds, it's very much inspired by it. Excellent. Well, they, I, I have absolutely no knowledge to add to that, so I will just leave that as it is. Um, Shai or Shay Adams saying, first live chat. So happy to be listening. Much love from Col uh, Colorado. Uh, great to have you uh, in the chat. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I was going to say something else. And tell you, oh, that was it. Uh, just before we move back onto the questions, uh, guys, I've been loving his dark materials uh, on on TV. If you've if you've not caught it, do it's. Uh, I think it's. I think it's on Netflix in America. It's on, if you're in the UK, it's on the BBC. You can catch it on the iPlayer. Um, uh, but it's really good and and absolutely does justice to the books. Um, I think it's too late for me to cover it for this season, but if you think it'd be something you might like me to do in the future, because uh, I'll probably do another couple of seasons to match the books, do let me know. I, I'm I'm mulling it over at the moment. But anyway, um, let's go back to the questions. So the Stark in Winterfell says, similar to Frown Pouch, this was a little while ago, but this was the question all about Howland's magic. Um, what do you think about the theory that Ned and his men were losing the battle outside of Tower of Joy, so Howland summoned water or something um, and drowned everyone but Ned and maybe Arthur, so Ned left the bodies because they didn't die of a sword fight, or maybe the Tower of Joy is now the Pond of Joy or something that they don't want anyone else seeing. So what do you reckon? Is there is there a chance that, uh, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of reframe this because we've talked about Mm -hmm. Howland using magic already, but in terms of this um, this phrase that we've got that Ned Stark came out with, that Bran quotes him on saying, uh, I would have died but for Howland Reed, uh, or Arthur Dane would have killed me but for Howland Reed. Clearly on the show, this was interpreted and shown as Howland Reed stabbed Arthur Dane in mm -hmm. the back. Now, uh, that's not the only way that you could stop some yeah Arthur Dane from killing Ned Stark. Do you think that it will be the same uh, in the books, or do you think that there is a more sort of magical possible possibility to what might have happened there, or a more boring, boring just uh, him calling out and saying, "Hey, stop it! You, you're being stupid," or something? Is, is there a, either, yeah. is, is there some other way other than stabbing him in the back? <sighs> I'm of two minds on this. I definitely don't think, well, I mostly don't think there is magic, but the actual thing that makes me think that there is a more of a possibility is that um, the Tower of Joy and how it was written, David Benioff um, wrote the movie Troy, the one about the Trojan War. And in that, he explains Achilles' heel as him being shot a bunch of times and then spoilers for Troy if you ever watch it. It's it's an okay movie. It's fine. But um, Achilles gets shots with a bunch of arrows, but then somebody pulls out all the rest of them except for the one in heel, and then soldiers see it and go, oh my god, Achilles was killed by an arrow to the heel. He must be a god. And that's that's basically his explanation. So he has a, he has a habit of taking sort of mythical, magical things and trying to give them a more grounded explanation in his writing. So could George do something different? Yes, he could. He clearly loves fantasy. He loves magic. If anyone would do it, it would be George. I don't think so because I, I, it, it's the kind. It's a kind of thing that we haven't seen yet, really. But it's always a possibility, especially taking into account that Weiss and Benioff wrote that scene. <laughs> uh, yeah, and just to, just to sort of come back on your. Uh, the the movie Troy is okay. I preferred the book. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, the yeah, I think I agree with you. I think that what we have to say just on the TV show, what happened at the Tower of Joy, is a simplified, cut down version. Undoubtedly, mm -hmm. they took the Danes. Effectively, the Danes are not in the story on the show. Um, they showed a little bit of Arthur Dane there, but they didn't 
they didn't mention really who he was in any way, shape or form. They showed the sword dawn, but without really explaining its significance. So they have taken House Dane out of the story. So we can't, once you do that, and once you also say they effectively took Howland Reed out of the story as well, we know Howland Reed is going to appear later in the books, George R. Martin's told us. Once you say they've taken both of those characters out, you say, okay, well, what's left? We can't suddenly have this character we've not introduced doing magic because everyone would go, whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> um, similarly, you can't have Arthur Dane and the Danes uh, and the trip to Starfall and the rest of it because people would be going, oh, this is really interesting. Who's this? A lot of people here. They must be really important. Um, it was a completely stripped down scene just to the basics and they were trying to do nods. This was the way they seemed to do direction was they were, they were trying to do nods to the books so that book readers would go, ah, yeah, so they understood that. So they, mm -hmm. they, they sort of stopped for a moment so that the camera sort of stared at the sword for a moment and we all went, ah, yes, that's, that's Dawn, we understand that. And, the bleeding and, uh, star, ah. Ex exactly. And, and so everybody thought, oh, yes, so they do understand the books that they've just decided to cut that bit out. So that seems to be what the plan was, not to actually show what happened in the books. So we shouldn't take what happened on the show as is often the case, as being what happened in the books, is, is my sort of uh, <laughs> top line on that one. He could. I, I don't think so, but I'm willing to be disproven. <laughs> okay, we've got a couple of people in the chat defending the film. Uh, Troy saying they had great... Uh, even Stephen Stark, actually. Hi, Stephen. Saying Troy had great fight choreography. I would definitely agree with that. That was yes, they, they did have some excellent fight scenes in there. Mm -hmm. um brennan barnes says robert and matt love both your channels thank you very much you mentioned the possibility of ned and howland needing to silence people potentially this is coming back to this idea about what what happens with the other people i cannot reconcile ned and howland killing an innocent servant squire or whomever else was there no matter the circumstance what about the possibility of ned and howland bringing whoever else was at the tower of joy to starfall out of the way deep into dawn I imagine some of the folks at the Tower of Joy may have been staff or staff and all. No, it wouldn't guarantee their silence, but it's also not murder to cover your tracks. Now, I think, Brennan, we pretty much covered this bit. Yeah. Um, I, I think we, we've got to there. Uh, the, uh, House Dane was central to whatever was going on there. So House Dane staff will have been uh, either on site or scurrying to and fro with food and provisions and messages and all the rest of it. So... Yes, if they were sure that they could be quiet and not say anything, then they would have been spared. I, the point I was trying to make was that what happens if there were people that they could not trust? Because Ned was absolutely certain, how and I suspect the same, that they had to cover their tracks. That mm -hmm. was, for me, this was the whole point about pulling down the Tower of Joy, not taking the Bannerman up. And it's not so much not taking the Bannerman back up to their homes, but never telling anyone where exactly where they were buried. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, fair enough, Ned might want to have like, buried them on site to prevent the birds from eating the bodies or whatever. You, you get that. But the moment that he realises, and Barbary Dustin, he stopped off at Barrowton, met Barbary Dustin, she would have made it very clear very clear that she wanted the body of her dead husband back. Um, and Ned not only did not give her the body of her dead husband, he didn't say, oh, I'll send some people back to go and bring it back up for you. And he didn't even tell her where this was, just a vague, oh, in the Red Mountains. Mm -hmm. So he was trying to cover his tracks 100%. The, the speculation we have is not about whether he was trying to cover his tracks, it's about why he was trying cover his tracks uh and so if you retrace all of that thinking back to the tower of joy itself if there was anyone that they could not trust they could not leave the tower of joy alive is the point i was trying to make there house dane staff i suspect they thought they could trust yeah because they were taking care of liana and john at that point and uh obviously 
Ned would have known what Arthur Dane being there meant along with seeing their servants. He's like, okay, so I probably don't have to kill you guys. That sort of thing. But yeah, Ned, like you were saying, definitely did try and successfully did a huge cover up to the point that wouldn't even tell Catelyn what happened. His own wife years mm-hmm. later still refused to talk about it. So the idea that he would in any way try to bring attention to the Tower of Joy and the bodies that are buried there it goes against what he's doing. It would have been nice for Barbary Dustin, but I think for Ned, the idea that it would it would make news, basically, Westerosi news, if he sent a bunch of northerners down to Dorne to dig up some corpses and bring them back. Everyone would wonder what the hell that was about. And they would yeah. start asking questions, especially if... Let's say somebody said, oh, where in the Red Mountains they went? And then people started using a map and going, wait, what happened yeah. here? Exactly. I think his, his aim was never, no one ever goes there. And and so we may speculate exactly why, but he basically was trying to cover his tracks. That bit, mm-hmm. I think, is clear. Girl Nettles uh, in the chat had a really interesting question, actually. Um, uh, I, saying, I think it's impossible that Ned and Howland beat the Kingsguard in a sword fight. The only way they survived was through magic. Come on, the Sword of the Morning lost to a couple of 18-year-olds, question mark. Um, uh, I entirely understand this perspective. I, what I will do for those who have not uh, sat down and thought about this in as much detail as perhaps I have uh, overthought it, probably, um, we've, got a, we've got a face-off between two sides. We've got three Kingsguard, and we've got seven people on Ned's side. Now, the three Kingsguard are allegedly and really almost certainly the finest fighter in, in, in mm-hmm. Westeros at the time. Uh, plus, um, uh, we get um, uh, Hightower, Gerald Hightower, who was at one point a good fighter but had recently taken a wound and was well past his best. Mm-hmm. So he was probably competent without being uh, great. Uh, and then we had um, Oswald Went, who we don't hear huge amounts about. Uh, he never seems to win any tournaments, but if he was a uh, if he was a member of the King's Guard, then presumably he was pretty good. So we've got one brilliant person, one person past their best, and one pretty good person. On the other side, you've got a, a couple of people who probably aren't worth much in a fight. Uh, Howland Reed seems not that great. He was beaten up by three squires. He may have put that on, but he doesn't seem to be a great fighter. Um, uh, and we get um, Ethan Glover, who was a squire. He was squire to Brandon Stark, um, and he, in fact, spent the last year or so in the Black Cells, so he was probably not a great fight himself. I think we can write those two off. But the others, we get Martin Castle, who... Uh, was Jory Castle's father, uh, and his father, I think, or his brother, was uh, an armor smith. They were close allies. They were almost certainly Martin Castle was a good fighter. Mm-hmm. Um, Theo Wall, we don't know huge amounts about, but Theo Wall was part of House Wall. House Wall are the closest that you get to like berserker barbarians in mm-hmm. the north. Uh, so he was probably, again, a good fighter. Um, we get Mark Ricewell, um, who was a knight. He was Sir Mark Ricewell. You don't get to be a knight unless you've got some ability, at least. So he was probably, again, a pretty good fighter. And then we got Lord Dustin, who we don't know huge amounts about, but if he was a lord, then he would have at least have been trained by proper uh, um, sort of uh, arms masters and the like, and Ned, who, as we know, became a very good fighter. So it's when you try and put these five probably good fighters and a couple of hangers on against one brilliant fighter, one pretty good fighter, and one past their best fighter, it looks quite even to me, and it makes sense. Mm-hmm. of the end, and I'll, I'll take, oh, this is my long, my long dissertation on this, I'll come to your thoughts in a moment, Matt, but it makes sense to me that the last people standing on each side would be Arthur Dane, who was clearly the best fighter there, and Ned Stark. Um, and Howland Reed looks like the kind of, seems like the kind of person who would just sort of like have taken a step back. So that as an ending point makes sense to me. Um, 
It also makes sense to me that if Arthur Dane and Ned Stark were up against each other, Arthur Dane would win. Yeah, definitely. And that's the point at which um, uh, Howland Reed apparently stopped it happening in some way. So what we're told, or the parameters of what we're told, makes sense to me. That's the kind of... It, it, it sort of feels right. It's not that it was overwhelming odds in one way or the other, but we do have one person who's clearly a better fighter than anyone else. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, Girl Nettles is probably a slightly longer answer than you were expecting <laughs> to this. Uh, the saying is impossible that Ned and Howland beat them. I think I would agree that other than an intervention from Howland, uh, that I think that Arthur Dane would definitely have killed Ned Stark, but I don't think this was an overwhelming one side is clearly better than the other situation. But uh, Matt, what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I have I have an anecdote about Arthur Dane that I think informs probably why he lost, and it's the story of Arthur Dane and the Smiling Knight and the Kingswood Brotherhood. Arthur Dane and, and the Smiling Knight are dueling each other, and it's actually a fairly close duel even with Dawn, but the Smiling Knight's sword has become nicked and it's breaking, and he can't really continue the duel. Rather than Arthur stopping, just saying, okay, I've beaten you, and just killing him, he stops and gets the Smiling Light another sword in order to keep fighting. Now, that's the height of honor, but that's also very bad tactically. It's very likely that Arthur would have taken the challenge from Ned Stark very seriously with chivalry and honor, and not tried to just win outright we we don't have a history of him doing that he's a great he's a great swordsman and he likes being a great swordsman he likes winning sword fights so if he went down i think the the show version of howland doing something underhanded to beat him it doesn't have to be that exactly but that's probably the right message that arthur was expecting a straight up duel and ned and howland in a moment of desperation broke the rules of knighthood and chivalry and just tried to win I would say that's probably what happened when it got down to the two of them. However that manifests, I don't really know, but I think that's the message that I think uh, the show is getting across. And I think George is getting across with that that uh, story about the Smiling Knight. Who would do that? Who would give their opponent a sword to keep fighting? That's a pretty ridiculous thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, someone who's very confident in their own abilities, I would suggest. That too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, and I think that's a really good way of, of sort of conceptualizing it. It may it may not have been that exact way mm-hmm. that Howland did it, but he broke the rules in some way. I sure. think makes sense. Um, Carl Karsnark just wanted to say, uh, saying, "I just made the greatest cup of coffee ever." How you may ask? Because I poured it into my official Indie Geek coffee <laughs> mug. Uh, I'm rubbish at doing uh, plugs for my own stuff, but if you want to get a mug. There's a link somewhere. Um, uh, it's not just mugs. I've got other stuff. Um, but thank you, Carl. I really appreciate it. Um, let's go back to uh, slightly... Di- well, we're moving s- away from what happened at the Tower of Joy, more towards the implications of it. Um, Casey of House Lawbridge says, how do you think that John will ever find out about his parents if he hmm. doesn't meet Howland? Um, the way he found out in the show uh, felt cheap. So in the show, it was this kind of combination of Sam picked up on the clues and then Bran went, oh, that's interesting, and sort of zooped off through the Weirwood network and discovered what was going on. And then Sam told John. Um, I kind of agree that's that felt a little bit cheap. Um, I'm holding out hope that Howland Reed may be the person who does it. I think we will see Helen Reed again. Um, and I think that there's a good chance that um, he may well head north in the next book or mm-hmm. at the end of the next book or the beginning of the Dream of Spring or something like that. There are people um, currently in the neck effectively looking for him and uh, Ned Stark's bones are coming up north as well. Everything seems to be sort of moving towards this idea that that's coming up from the neck. Uh, Howland Reed may well uh, head back up to Winterfell, uh, but but what what do you reckon, Matt? In terms of how will John find out? Um, uh, if it, is it going to be the same way, or is it going to be a slightly different way? The idea that um, some sort of magical means of getting this information is, I would say, definitely not off the table. 
Uh, George has conspicuously basically killed everybody except Howland that knows what's going on, or they've just disappeared off the face of the planet. So if we're getting down to how he's going to figure out, yeah, it's Howland or it's something weird or magical. The other possibility that people um, like theorizing about is Liana's tomb, that John has a lot of dreams thinking about that there's something down in the crypts of Winterfell waiting for him that he doesn't want, that he yells that I'm not a Stark, I'm a Snow, that I don't belong here, that kind of thing. So some people think like Rhaegar's harp would be down there. There's been other um, uh, Rhaegar signet ring or um, a dragon egg, and any sort of item in some way that would have been buried in her crypt with Lyanna that's a memento of Rhaegar that would indicate that it was um, that the two of them were more in love than the traditional story that is told. So that one, that one has a much more Arthurian background to it. There's this, I think it's Lancelot. He goes down into a tomb and sees a, um, a, like a prophecy or something. He, there's something on a, a piece of stone that he reads that informs him of what his real identity is. And so people have pointed to that, that since the tower of joy is also basically present in Arthurian legend, that maybe that's where this is going. So yeah, I mean, I, uh, I I do like that. I think that it's it's worth it. This is in the books. It wasn't, I think, in the show at all. John has these repeated dreams yeah. connected with um, uh, being on his own and going down into the crypts of Winterfell. And it's curious in that the dreams are taking him down there, and yet he's almost feeling pushed out, and he want, doesn't want to be there, and the he feels that the people that the, the spirits don't want him to be there, and yet he's feeling taken down there. So it's it it's definitely this kind of sense that you're not who you think you yes. are. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, the question is, does this mean that he has to actually follow this dream in some way in reality in order to find some bit of information out? Um, I I mean my. Uh, sort of casting my mind forward i think that there's going to be obviously there's lots of things going on in the crypts i think we will find that there is going to be somebody hiding out in the crypts mance raider mm -hmm. um i think so i think that he is definitely going to be down there he doesn't know these things but um i, I think that uh that a lot more will happen in the crypts in the sh books than happened on the show um, i like this idea maybe there's some kind of hint of his identity in there um uh, but mm, I'm not sure. It's... Yeah, personally, I think I hope he never finds out. I think um, this is going to actually, this is a video I forgot to mention that I'm going to make, but Martin consistently has characters that learn of their destiny or their secret identity in some way that it always crushes them, that it destroys them, that it leads them down like sort of a dark path. I mean, uh, Stannis is probably the the biggest example. People have talked about Danny and in some ways that her knowledge of being the the savior of the world in some way is pushing her to things she wouldn't normally do. And if John is supposed to be the the hero of the world and like the person that does the selfless thing that is the right thing but not the not for glory, then if he never actually knew he was king and did it anyway, that would be a much more powerful message for him as a character, I would say. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I still go with my take that um, John is being written as the Aragorn character is actually the Frodo character. Yeah. I think that he will discover who he is, and I think he will reject it all at the end as a broken man and sure. head, head off north. I think the show got that bit right. I don't think they got all of the details of how it led to it right. But I think that the idea of John heading north, having turned his back on this uh, this world that he played his full part in saving, I think that that is, uh, is where this kind of George R. R. Martin playing against the rules idea comes. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to, he has to discover that he could be king and people would probably allow him to be king. Um, uh, but he just doesn't, want it sure. anymore. Both are good stories. I would prefer the one where he doesn't find out, but open to both. Um, uh, Christian Isidoro says, <coughs> hi, Robert and Joe. To bounce off of Casey's question, which is the earlier one, about how, to, how we'll find out, 
If it becomes widely known that John was born and Rhaegar and Lyanna were legitimately married, might the tower be rebuilt as a memorial to either of them in an epilogue to the story? Um, I'll start on this one. Uh, I don't want there to be an epilogue to the story. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I like the idea, but it, it, for those who've read the Harry Potter books, the bit I hated the most was this kind of 20 years later thing that they did at the end and it was just like no i don't i don't want to know what happens after all i want to the story to end and then us to be left with the feelings of that story not a oh and by the way then this character <laughs> did that and that character became that and it was like no i don't i don't i don't need that so personally no i don't think so but that's a personal preference <laughs> what, what what do you think matt I think that building a memorial to Tower of Joy would be the kind of thing Robert Baratheon would do for Lyanna, where it's him giving her the feather and saying she belongs up on a hill, not where she is. The Starks have a, a very strong connection to their home and the crypts themselves and their ancestry. And John knows that. He's obsessed with the crypts in his own weird way. So if, if he found out who Lyanna is, I think he would just do what Ned does and go down there and think about her and give her a blue rose. And that would be as far as it goes, basically. That would be the stark way to celebrate her. Yeah. And I think this is one other bit of evidence that um, Ned never, uh, Ned destroyed the Tower of Joy and he never told anyone where it was, is that Robert Baratheon doesn't seem to have put some kind of memorial up there or gone on some kind of weird pilgrimage there or anything like that, mm -hmm. because he would have done. If he yep. knew where it was, that's it, he's it, he he was obsessed with her. So um, the fact that he never did is a clear indication that he didn't know exactly where this place was, other than in the Red Mountains. Maura Lee says he mentioned in a previous live stream that we will see Howland read again, possibly in the last book. Yeah, well, this is this is what George R. R. Martin says that we will see him again, but he just knows too much, so he can't appear just yet. What about Ashara Dane? If she did not commit suicide, if they could not find a body, will she show up with Howland in the last book? I'd love to hear what information she could add to what happened, especially when Ned went to Starfall to return Arthur Dane's sword. Uh, why don't I throw this one to you first, Matt? What, what do you think? Will we see Ashara Dane again? Um, this is one I love teasing um, Chloe or Liza and Arbergold, the... the um... Uh, no, it's Queen of Love and Booty. That's her name on Twitter, or the co-host of Girls Gone Canon. This is one of her favorite uh, theories that Ashara Dane lived and that she's married to Helen Reed and uh, Hashara, she calls it. Yeah, uh, Bernie's saying it in the chat. Hashara, the the. I love teasing her that it's not that it's not going to happen. That Ashara is totally dead. How can she be married to Helen when she's dead on the rocks? That kind of thing. Because me and Chloe have that. I like teasing her, but I mean. It, it is certainly not impossible that she survived. It is a weird story. Why did she kill herself? The the whole thing about her having a baby and then not, and that you would have to you have to invent a whole story around it to even explain why she killed herself upon Ned coming back to Starfall. So I think there's more to be told there that and I think this is one of those George gardening moments where he left himself the possibility if he wants her to show up, this he could do it, basically. Um, I don't know if he will. He tends to do this quite a lot, where he sets up all these things and just sometimes he pays them off and sometimes he doesn't, and he just kind of ties it off. But the hints are always there. Like the most, one of the more famous ones is in A Game of Thrones. He had initially intended for Catelyn Stark to die beyond the wall uh, to the White Walkers. Uh, while she was sheltering her children. And there's a lot of foreshadowing there that that's where that was going to go. He ended up abandoning that and instead turning it into foreshadowing for Lady Stoneheart, using the same evidence and the same foreshadowing for a different purpose. So could he do that with Ashara? Sure. I don't know if he will. I, I tend to think probably not. He seems to have um, emphasized more Ned Dane and Darkstar as the Danes he's going to focus on, but I mean... It's certainly a fishy story, to say the least, so he could. 
Yeah, and I, to the best of my knowledge, have never met or spoken to Chloe, but uh, she <laughs> clearly is an incredibly wise person. Um, yeah. Howland and Ashara clearly did meet and fall in love and have been <laughs> end uh, of so story. You're one of them. Uh, I am one of them. I've got a video okay. on it if you are interested. Um, it's uh, It makes complete sense to me. And I love it. It's one of my favourite theories simply because people who've never looked at the evidence, and I think there is evidence, when you just say Howland and Ashara had baby Mira, they just think, you're just plucking names out of nowhere. There's, there's, <laughs> a, there's nothing going on here. Um, but then you kind of try and add it up and it does make sense. Um, so uh, I think that's that's there. Whether she will appear, I think is a different matter. I think Howland uh, will appear. I think that she is currently in the neck with Howland Reed. Whether she will, I mean, perhaps she would stay there. Uh, we've not heard of any other members of House Reed. So if Howland does move out uh, and head up north, perhaps she will stay to sort of look after the fort, so to speak. Um, so, yeah, I think that's entirely possible. And I think that what she knows, Howland knows. So I think that she wouldn't add an extra thing on there. Or There's if you look at it there, the other way around. I'm, yeah. Go on. I'm, not, I'm not denying the evidence. I'm not denying that the possibility is there. Uh, you, you and Chloe have both made strong cases that it may very well be true. I would be pleasantly surprised if it was i'd be like oh cool she's alive she's not down on the rocks that's a better story for her she's not on the rocks the, the body is not found if it was on the rocks it would have been found this is just there's a lot of rocks i don't know i mean i think they probably would have looked for a long time <laughs> um and, and anyway this is uh, uh as genevieve river says the lad and the maid and anyone who's uh read that bit of the book will know what i mean absolutely makes sense oh, okay i'll i um, you've pulled me in um so the for me the big bit of in, of of uh biggest clue here is when um uh Jojen and Mira are telling the story of the tourney at Harren Hall and this is about the lad who is Howland Reed right. and the maid uh, and basically this whole story is, yet yeah, it could have been about all of these amazing things that were going on at the Tony Harren Hall, but actually what seems to be the focus of this story is how uh, their dad um, saw this woman, her hair is described, the colour of her eyes is described, everybody she danced with that night is described in huge detail. Um, and this seems to be a story, as they say, their dad has told them many, many times, so they've memorised so we're left with two options. Either this is a How I Met Your Mother story that Howland Reed was telling <laughs> his children, or this was a Just Before I Met This Mother, I met, I met this really hot woman with these amazing eyes. Let me tell you all about her. <laughs> uh, out of those two, I know which I think sounds more plausible. Um, and the way the story is structured, all the characters in that um, are told as having a nickname based upon their house or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like... Uh, like you get the uh, the the young pup or the dragon prince or something along those lines. The except of for, stolen kisses. Exactly, except for two characters, the lad and the maid. And this is the story of the lad and the maid. And the lad was Howland, and the maid was Ashara. So that that's for for me is that is that is the 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 biggest evidence of what was going on there. The how I met your mother story. It would seem uh, really awesome if she was alive. At which she clearly is. Um, <laughs> uh, let's move on to a question from um, da -da -da -da. Chase. Uh, how did Ned get away with the lie that Leanna died of an illness uh, or fever uh, without people not suspecting that she died in childbirth? The rumour was that she was kidnapped and raped um, and so there's always the possibility that that could have led to pregnancy. And then Ned rides up to King's Landing to make peace with Robert with a baby in tow. Uh, why did people not just come up with this idea? Oh, hang on a moment. Maybe this is Leanna's baby. So how do you think he got away with that? Well, it sort of depends on who you're talking about would have guessed this. The Dornish at that point would never reveal that they knew 
that uh, Jon Snow was Rhaegar's son because it means Robert st- uh, coming down the prince's pass with an army to kill everyone that helped Rhaegar. So the people th- that locally that know would never say anything. So they're not going to question it. Um, Ned as well, we hear over and over and over again, the explanation George gives us is that he is so honorable, that he is so focused on doing the right thing at all times, that nobody believes he would lie about this, that to a fault, he does everything to a T, that he is the noblest man in the the Seven Kingdoms. We know that's not exactly true, um, but that's his reputation. And it's sort of the thing where if Ned says it's true, it's got to be true. And they, all, I think a lot of people also assume that Robert and Ned were so close that he would, if that was Rhaegar's son, that he wouldn't keep that from him. I, I think pe- maybe people that don't know him that well, don't know how care, how deeply he cares about his family and Lyanna and keeping his, his word, would probably assume that the two best friends in the Seven Kingdoms would probably have spoken about that kid. And therefore, if Robert's not mad, then he must know it's... It's Ned's and not Rhaegar's, that kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. A couple of people in the chat, by the way, just arrived saying, oh, is Robert going off on a hound of the Mishara yep. again? Yes, yeah. I was. Uh, so, uh, but I've stopped now. It's safe. Um, in terms of that, I agree with what you were saying there. Um, people would have trusted Ned because of his reputation. I think it's probably also worth pointing out a couple of things. Uh, firstly, that... Um, Ned did not stop and hang around and have long chats and all the rest of it. Um, He was charging up north as quickly as he could. He got in there uh, at at a time when the place was still up in arms. Robert was just newly king. Um, uh, He was still appointing people. There was lots going on. There wasn't time to be sort of cross-questioning absolutely everything. The important thing was Ned came in, made up with Robert and moved up moved on and the second thing is uh there's no uh, we we don't have any actual information about that meetup then mm. but there's no hint that he came with a baby and said oh by the way i've got a baby um uh, as far as we can tell the the baby yes was in this party that went with him but he wouldn't have like come in with this baby there it, it, it's entirely possible in fact i would say it's quite likely that he got up to Winterfell and then allowed it to be known that he got this baby and didn't introduce it to everybody at King's Landing Probably. because there will be a there were some clever people there who might Barris. have put two and two together. <laughs> Barris, exactly. Uh, so I think that it's entirely possible that he kept the baby outside King's Landing. Maybe he allowed Howland and Ashara, because they were going up together, of course. Uh, yes, I went there again. Um, uh, that Maybe he let them look after it for a while while he nipped over to King's Landing to deal with, with Robert. Uh, so uh, there's no hint that this was a here's a baby, um, by the way, this is my baby, definitely not Liana's. there's no chance it was Liana's. definitely mine. That <laughs> seems not to have happened. He didn't even have to try and lie. I, I would also point out that when we, when Ned goes down to King's Landing for the first time, all the schemers there think he is totally incapable of lying and totally incapable of trying to disguise his intentions. That clearly, this is not just like, oh, it's it's like a meme about Ned. Everyone really does think he's like this, that he would never do something like that, that he would never lie like that about something that important. They think he's just a northern simpleton, basically. Yeah, which in many ways he is, but he was better at lying than they think. Um, guys, we've got a couple more questions, I think, from my uh, patrons coming up. Um, uh, so we'll, I think we'll probably go for about another 20 minutes or so. Um, Michaela Smith saying, have you ever thought about how history would have been different if the Tower of Joy events didn't happen? I'm reading a Song of Ice and Fire series and it was, and I was thinking about how things have been so different if the events of the Tower of Joy didn't happen. Curious to know your thoughts. So what, what, what do you reckon to that one, Matt? What, how would things be different? Uh, I'm not laughing at the question. It's um, I always love these sort of, if this had happened, what would have been different? My favorite example of this is the story of Elia Martell and Oberyn going around looking for a husband for Elia. And the story is they met Baylor Hightower and Elia was smitten with him until Baylor Hightower accidentally farted. 
And then Oberyn made fun of him so badly that Elia laughed and could not take Baylor seriously anymore, ending what looked to be a sure marriage. And it's like, there's all these little small moments all throughout the story. If they had gone this way, different things would happen. Like Elia would have married Baylor, therefore never would have married Rhaegar, therefore X, Y, Z. It, it, it just goes on all the way down. It's It would have been very interesting. But also the other answer to this is, <laughs> it's more of a practical one. If it had never happened, we would not have a story. <laughs> like George is introducing conflict and telling it in a certain way. And he's going to make weird things happen so that he can t say what he wants basically yeah yeah exactly so uh and i think that we're, when we're talking about what if the events of the tower of joy didn't happen um it, i mean it really depends what you mean by the events of it uh, you can sort of say what would have happened if you know there wasn't the fight what would have happened if all those people didn't die or what would have happened if uh, if ned had not gone there what would have happened if they went to a different place all these this is where the, sort of the story just like darts off in a million different directions mm -hmm. for the story to work there has to be this central mystery yeah and and incidentally this is one of the one of the things it's not there are many many more than this but one of the reasons why this kind of idea that john is not Rhaegon Lyanna's son doesn't make so much sense from a story because this is baked into the story as the central mystery. Mm -hmm. And if it turns out that Ned is just the, oh, sorry, that John is just the uh, the son of a, a random noble woman that, that Ned had sex with once, every single other person on Westeros would go, oh, okay. Neat. Cool. Who cares? Fair enough. Yeah. That's what we thought yeah. happened. He has and, and, to be important for it to matter. Exactly. So there has to be a reason for this, the, this big secret which is hinted at all the way through. So it's it's a really it's a central uh part of what this uh what this story is. Um let's get so this is my last question I've got from my patrons. Uh but so if you've got any final questions, now is the time to uh <laughs> Drop them in, sorry, B1 Mary saying, even in Game of Thrones, fart jokes are funny. Well, <laughs> George loves his childish humor. It's all over George the place. George does That's indeed great. love his childish humor. Now is the time to drop your final questions into the chat. If you have them, we'll try and pick out a few uh, before we end up. Um, uh, Maura Lee uh, asks, speaking of Arthur Dane's sword, what role do you and Joe see the sword playing Ooh. in the last two books? Is this sword Lightbringer? If so, who is Azora High? Will it be someone who is deemed worthy from House Dane? So um, we're, we're taking one step from the house from the Tower of Joy, but this there is a clear link here because Ned took the Sword Dawn to back to the the um, House Dane to Starfall, and that is going to be important. So. What role do you see it having? Uh, I wrote a, a Reddit post about this a while ago. Um, it, it actually goes with another theory of mine, the Brienne the Beauty one, where George, when he abandoned the five-year gap, he ended up abandoning some uh, plot lines and ended up making new characters to fill them. Like um, in a five-year gap, Ned Dane would be about the same age as Darkstar, or at least in the same ballpark. And it seems like he invented him as a character because he wants somebody to go to Starfall and retrieve Dawn in some way. He wants it out of the castle. I think his plan was Ned Dane. He's abandoned that because he's too young. He's, he's Arya's age at this point. So he invented Darkstar to go do that. But the theory I came up with is that the two of them are going to meet because Darkstar is probably, he's on his way towards the High Hermitage in Starfall. If he gets the sword Dawn, what's he going to do with it? Well, the only real person he can go to because he pissed off the Martells is probably going to be Fagon or um, Aegon the Sixth, who has just landed, and that's where um, Arianne Martell is on her way. Anax actually is there now, and that's who he knows. So I, I think it would be really interesting if Ned Dane is on his way down, as we know he is. He broke off from the Brotherhood without banners down to Dorne and comes across Darkstar, and I. I <laughs> I think there's even a possibility they may meet themselves at the Tower of Joy, at the ruins of it, which I think would be really interesting, especially because there's a, there's a weird symmetry to it, okay? So it's Edric Dane, but he's called Ned. Darkstar's name is Gerald. At the Tower of Joy, 
on one side there was a Ned, on the other side there was a Gerald, and Don was involved. So George could be doing, he could write a scene, and I think this would be really cool if he did, where the two of them meet and there's some sort of fight over Don between the Danes. Um, I, I'd never thought of that before. I think that, that's a fascinating that's why it's a good theory, I, I, Robert. That's why I wrote it. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I think for me, I would say yes, Gerald Dane Darkstar is going to take the sword, yeah. Dawn. Um, uh, whether he meets Ned, there, I love that idea of meeting where the Tower of Joy was. I, not in I, off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly where Ned Dane is in the story right now. I think I last um, saw him in the Riverlands. After Lucas um, Hart took over, he and a bunch of them went south. When so he went south, south, did he? Okay. Yeah. Um, so yes, I think that's possible. I think where it will end up is, as you say, um, in King's Landing. I think Fagon Aegon is going to take King's Landing. I think that he will take in Dark Star as part yes. of his King's Guard, uh, which that's is a kind of an exactly an echo of the Arthur Dane being part of the King's Guard for uh, Aerys II. The question is, where does it go after that? So uh, once they have been destroyed in some way, the sword is just sort of lying around. Is it just going to be lying around somewhere in King's Landing? I, uh, it clearly is going to be important, and it's going to be important in, uh, in somehow ending uh, the Long Night. Is, is the oh. implication of what we've got going okay. on here. Um, because you have the sword of the morning, we have dawn, everything seems to be about ending night. Um, so that's what's going on there. The, the When you get John killing Daenerys on the show, I think that we have to say that it was just like with a random uh, dagger. dagger. It, it would make given that there's clearly a sort of an Azora High image there, Nisa Nisa image there, if something similar is going to happen in the books, and I think it will, uh, then it would make more sense for it to be with some kind of symbolic sword. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I think the short answer is I do not have a final idea yet. I will work up on, uh, an idea on this one, uh, and I'll come up with a theory because lots of people ask about it. But I think that in the short term, uh, Gerald Dane takes it, becomes a member of the King's Guard in King's Landing to Fagon, uh, and then uh, I think he will die, and then we're looking for who's going to be taking it next and doing the things that it's kind of fated to be doing. Um, let's uh, pick up on uh, some questions in the chat. Um, uh, Plexi Bertrand says, do you think Ashara may have been one of Liana's attendants at Tower of Joy. That would have been a hard task to recruit for, discretion and trust being necessary. Yeah, I think it's entirely possible. I think it's, it's possible uh, from a number of angles. Firstly, because House Dane, as we've already said, is clearly deeply involved in this. Secondly, because I still, I when we uh, hear about Rhaegar going off and picking up Lyanna, uh, the idea of him going there with, we know he had two Kingsguard, um, possibly another couple of loyal lieutenants that we we hear about, uh, but we hear about like half a dozen or so of his closest companions. Shara Dane was probably there, and it makes sense to me if you're going to go and pick up uh, this woman and take her somewhere that you, know, you, you don't really know her that well, that you take another woman with you if you're someone who appears to be as caring as, Re as Rhaegar is. And she probably would have met Ashara Dane already. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense to me that Ashara Dane was actually there as part of Rhaegar's crew going up to Harrenhal area and then coming back down. So that makes absolute sense uh, for me. And adds another possibility to this. Maybe Howland stopped uh, Arthur... Uh, from killing um, Ned with a slightly, you know, with another uh, a slightly more boring way, um, uh, in that actually suddenly he's like Arthur's brother-in-law. Um, <laughs> does does that does that like add a little bit? Does that mean that Arthur Dane would actually stop and listen to him because he's now family? Um, 
opens up that possibility. What what do you think? Do you think Ashara Dane was there? I think she was at some point, but not during the battle. Because um, if you notice Ned's crew, on their, you detailed all of them. They're all Northerners. None of them know anybody in Dorne. They stick out like a sore thumb. Ned had to talk to somebody because he doesn't know he doesn't know Dorne either. He doesn't know what this watchtower is. He doesn't know what the Red Mountains are. He's never been there. So somebody has to tell him where to go or lead him there. And the only person in Dorne that he knows at that time is probably Ashara Dane. And they seem to have a pretty good relationship. Or Howland, if you believe in Hashar. One of the two. I think she's the the information that got them to the Tower of Joy, not realizing it would lead to a um, an all out brawl, basically. Yeah, I, I think I think that's entirely possible as well. Um, just having a quick flick through. Have you seen any other questions you think would be worth us picking up before we uh, call it a day? Um, let's see here. Looking for questions. People are. <laughs> uh, well, there's about. a lot of good chat going on. Um, uh, the Green Bard was asking whether Sharadane might have been sent to the Vale as an envoy by Rhaegar um, and then becomes the fisherman's daughter. Uh, the fisherman's daughter was this character who uh, was on this ship, apparently, um, uh, with uh, Ned Stark, where he got shipwrecked just off the north of the Vale. Um, uh, I think the answer to that is no, simply because there's no evidence of it. Um, I can't, I mean, I, I, I don't think, that it, possibly, because we don't know where she was at the time, but there's absolutely no evidence that that was what was going on there. Why Rhaegar would want to send an envoy to the Vale, or, or any of that, there's no there's no, no hints of it. It would be a cool idea, though, if, um, if Ned had, like, if Ashara was like this, this like secret agent sort of person, or like somebody going undercover, like a secretly very capable woman, along the lines of like Asha Greyjoy or Arya, and like because he's kind of a not good at that stuff, he's not good at subterfuge. So him getting back to the getting back to the north, he probably had help from somebody. That's probably a, a different story, but it would be a fun idea if like secret agent Ashara helping out Ned. I, th I think it is a fun idea. I think that. We have to accept the fact that actually going to the veil is not just a thing that you can easily do. No, you need um, a way in. At, at that time, there are two real ways in. There was Gull Town, which is the mm. only real big port, and that was having a huge siege going on. Um, you wouldn't get in that way, and then you get uh, the 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 way that Tyrion goes uh, with um, uh, Bronn and all the rest of it in. Book one, season one, uh, through the the pass through the mountains of the moon, um, that was going to be blocked off to people because they were at war, uh, and so it wasn't just a, and you couldn't just go off into the mountains and make your own way through very easily because there were um, the the mountain clans there, as again we saw in book one, season one. Uh, so the idea of this being some sort of a random envoy who sort of managed to make their way up there doesn't really work. Um, uh, th there's no evidence for it, and it doesn't make much kind of practical sense either. But it would be cool. <laughs> it would be cool. I will give you that one. Um, <laughs> okay, guys, I think we are going to wrap this one up now. Um, as always, I think, Matt, I will give you a chance to tell everybody where they can find your beautiful face on the internet. Well, not usually my face, only on streams. <laughs> my videos are generally without without all this uh yeah you can find me on U my youtube channel youtube.com slash joe magician um i'm transitioning back to doing more book focused a song of ice and fire uh videos after doing a bunch of obviously game of thrones the tv show stuff um maybe starting something on the expanse we'll see i, I have to get the other books and see if if i want to continue but that's definitely a possibility maybe lord of the rings i also um other other things I'm thinking about. Uh, can also find me on the uh, Maester Monthly podcast, the podcast I put on with the other Song of Ice and Fire mods. On I, I forgot this one. I forgot my title during the first thing. Uh, Watchers on the Wall, you can find me there as a feature writer. Uh, last thing I put up was a beer review. Speaking of, a lot of people were asking what I was drinking during the stream. It's the latest Oma Gang beer. That's, and I thought it was really good, so I bought one just for myself. Um, 
unsponsored. I didn't get paid to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, you can also find my work on um, my podcast feed, The Wit and Wisdom of Joe Magician, and on Twitter at The Joe Magician. And Patreon, patreon.com slash Joe Magician. Look at all this brand recognition. They're all the same. I'm thinking. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Not just a pretty face, people. He is clever, too. Uh, okay, guys, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Matt, for coming on. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the the super chats and the fantastic chat. Really interesting questions uh, today. It's a fantastic topic. I'm sure I'll be coming back to it again at some point, uh, and I'm sure I'll have Matt on again at some point. Um, I will just make Matt go away for just one second. <laughs> Do not panic. This is simply so that I can say, if you're interested in watching other videos uh, that I do, other live streams uh, with other creators, then there will be a link appearing somewhere here um, after this, uh, if you, not if you're watching live, but a little bit later. And if you're interested, uh, somewhere up here will be a link to my Patreon page if you're uh, interested in either supporting the channel or getting access to some of the uh, the exclusive things I do for my patrons. Okay, guys, thank you so much. I'll be back same time next week looking at uh, art and symbolism in A Song of Ice and Fire. I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks, Matt. Take care, everyone. I'll see you again next week. Goodbye, everybody.